Well, good morning, everybody. I just heard the CFA siren, so it's 10 o'clock and it's time to start our service. So I'd like to invite everybody to come in and uh, take a seat and get comfortable. Uh, welcome to St Luke's this morning. It's lovely to have you here. My name is Julia Graham, if you don't know me. Well, what a week we've had. Most people will know that up here in the hills, um, we've had a pretty serious storm event and other places too. I mean, our son in Kilsyth had no power. We know people in um, Donvale who had no power. So it's not just in the hills. But many homes have been damaged and many of us are still without power. And uh, do we have people here who are still without power? Yes, quite a few. Um, and combined with an ongoing lockdown that's uh, taking its time to, um, you know, we're taking a while to come out of that, it's enough to make us feel a bit miserable, isn't it? But let us not be miserable. Let's enjoy our time together this morning, spending time with our loving God, one who we can rely on to get us through our darkest hours. There is no promise in the Bible, given in the Bible, that he will protect us from troubles. But his promise is that he will walk beside us as we live our lives, giving us the courage and strength we need when we call on him. Last week, Paul shared with us a little of his testimony, how he came to know Jesus in a personal way. I suspect that everybody here today either here in person or watching from home, knows about Jesus. But do we know him personally? Do we actually have a relationship with him? Nicodemus was a Pharisee, an important religious leader in Jesus' time. He thought he'd heard it all. He knew the scriptures. He obeyed the rules. He went to the temple regularly. He gave offerings. And he was a kind and considerate man. Quite a few ticks there, aren't there? Yet, as Jesus spoke about eternal life, Nicodemus realised that he was missing something. So he made an appointment to talk with Jesus. He wanted more information. Jesus told him that in order to enter heaven, to gain eternal life, he would need to be born again. Nicodemus didn't get it. He asked Jesus how it was possible for a grown man to become a baby again and be born of his mother a second time. But Jesus wasn't talking about a physical rebirth. He was talking about a spiritual birth. Though Nicodemus knew a lot about God, he didn't actually know God personally. Jesus was telling Nicodemus that he needed to come to God in humility, admit his need for a saviour and seek forgiveness for his sins. Nicodemus finally understood and became a follower of Christ. Though it was slow, his lifestyle eventually began to reflect his newfound faith. What about you? Do you actually have a personal, growing relationship with the creator of the universe? Or do you simply know a lot about him? It can be easy to settle into a good reputation and develop a good habit of church attendance. But if that's all our Christianity consists of, we're lacking a great deal. Let us walk the walk together and not just talk the talk. Bruce will be giving us the message today and it's about the Holy Spirit's ministry in our personal lives. I'm really looking forward to that. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that our power back is back on here at the church and that we are able to meet here today as your people. We thank you that you love us and that you want to help us through difficult times. We lift up our service today and ask that you would bless us as we meet together under your name. We pray, Lord, that everything we do here will be pleasing in your sight and will glorify your holy name. Amen. I'd like to invite the music group up now. For our first two songs. Good morning, everyone. And um, I know it's really hard to sing with masks on, <clears throat> but.
but um, can I really encourage you that it, it really lifts your spirits to, even if you hum in the back of your throat, like, <laughs> you know, if you don't want to breathe all your huffing air back in, um, just engage with it and, and um, God knows our heart. And uh, he, he also likes us to make a joyful noise. So, you know, if you... If it's a, just a humming along um, thing, that's great. I, I noticed as I chose the small songs uh, yesterday, this morning, yesterday, um, that there was a bit of a theme running through them, and it was about God's faithfulness. And I thought, isn't that um, something that is a real encouragement for us after such a week uh, to recognise that we can rely on Him even when all the things that we get used to relying on uh, let us down. And uh, I know that some people have um, been dealing with illness and they may feel like the um, world's not too good a place either. And I think it's great to focus on the character of God and who he is. Now, singers are going to lead you in the first verse um, and I'll ask you to stay seated. And then stand and join us when we move into the chorus. So enjoy Great Is Thy Faith.
Well, thank you, music team. What beautiful songs to start the morning off with. How great is thy faithfulness. Must be my favourite hymn of all times, and I know I'll be just humming it all day from now on. And if David's really unlucky, I'll be singing it in full <laughs> throttle. Uh, <laughs> All right, so it's notices time now. Um, there's been an awful lot of work going on here since the storm. You may not realise. Um, a special mention to our tech team, Bruce, David and Michael, up the back, who've had to reset everything, all the devices. Also to the lumberjacks, Bruce and, Bruce and Jenny, who attacked that huge tree that fell down. Couldn't believe it on Thursday when I saw that. Just missed the church. And I believe there's a bit of a funny story about um, chair legs. Who wants to tell us the story? Come on, Bruce. No, he's saying no. Apparently, they were trying to, they were cutting up the tree and they hit metal. And they went, oh, that's one, that's good for the chainsaw and a bit dangerous. And what is this metal? Did something get caught up under the tree? But no, apparently they were chair legs of a metal chair, which David tells me someone had perhaps 30 years ago flung up into a tree. Who said that? Who? Paul probably flung it. And, um, yes, yeah, so that was interesting. The chair legs were sort of sticking out of the tree. It had grown around it. How odd. 
So thank you so much for all that behind the scenes work. Um, flood repairs to the building are progressing well. New carpet has been laid in the offices and thankfully no leaks this past week. Uh, Parish Council meets on Tuesday evening at 7.30 for those involved. And the Incumbency Committee continues to interview candidates. Please continue to pray for this hard-working group and for the right person to, um, to be sent to us soon. The Vicarage painting has been uh, going along and it's almost done, I believe. And great thanks there to Peter and Karen and Ray who've been up at the Vicarage uh, many, many hours making that happen. And when we have a working bee again, and I'm not sure when that is, we'll have an opportunity to walk through and, and have a look at the vicarage, all shiny and repainted, which will be lovely. Uh, Naomi had some lovely news, and I'm going to ask her to come up and tell you about it. Thanks, Julia. Well, I think we can all agree the last 12 months has been particularly challenging, and um, with that, we know we know of people who have struggled. We know of businesses who have struggled, but we also have community groups that have struggled. And one of those that, after COVID, um, was unable to reform was the Gembrook Play Group. Um, earlier this year, they actually approached me and said, "Would St Luke's be interested in taking on the Gembrook Play Group? Because we just can't." form a committee, we're unable to keep it running and we would hate to lose this service within the Gembrook community. So uh, that got taken to Parish Council and said, hey, is this something that we can get behind? Is there a way that we can do this? And Parish Council um, said, we absolutely want to see this continue, but uh, let's look at how we do it. Um, and in amongst all of that, um, the line, new mercies every morning that uh, came out of that song, just reminded me of how even in the challenges God provides opportunities and, and new, op new things that we don't necessarily think about. Um, HCSI was informed about seven weeks ago that one of our community partners was not going to uh, go for funding again for the next 12 months. They were stepping back. So there was new Anglicare funding available that is very, very, very rare. Uh, so we had the opportunity to apply for a 12-month funding and um, I applied for it for the Gembrook Playgroup to be an extension of the work that happens here with HCSI in partnership with St Luke's. And the really, really good news is we found out uh, that we have been received 12 months worth of funding to be able to ensure that the Gembrook Playgroup can run for the next 12 months. And prayerfully, that will just get that um, open that door that little bit more in our work in Gembrook and we can see that continue long term. So yeah, that definitely does, uh, is, is something to something to be excited about. So please be praying with us as we seek to engage what is left of the Gembrook Playgroup and bring them along on this journey. Please be praying for wisdom and grace about how we enter into that space and um, Preferably by partway through next term, in term three, we will be able to see uh, an extension of the amazing work that happens here uh, start in Gembrook, and that will complement our Gembrook commotion. So, yeah, just amazing news. So thank you for your prayers. Wow, what great news that is. Uh, does anybody else have any notices that I might have forgotten about or not known about? Um, Kids Church is on today and it's probably time for them to go now. So if the children would like to follow uh, Brodie and Steve out the back, they'll have all sorts of terrific things planned for you. So I'm going to hand over now to Lorraine, who's going to lead us in a time of prayer. Good morning, everybody. It, it must be a time for, um, so I'll take it off so you can hear me. It must be time for um, uh, old hymns this morning because as I was driving along this morning, I was listening to Classic FM who have a one, top 100 countdown. This time it's music you can't live without. And I was listening and they played a piece of music called, which is now called um, Finlandia by Sibelius. And some of you might actually know the tune because it was 
um, there were a few different sets of hymn words set to this tune, and I just want to read um, from one set of words to Finlandia. We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe. Strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender, we rest on thee, and in thy name we go. We go in faith, our own great weakness feeling, and needing more each day thy grace to know. Yet from our hearts a song of triumph pealing, we rest on thee, and in thy name we go. Let us pray. Dear Lord, this has been a long week. Um, for many, they've had a week without electricity, no, no power, um, a week of difficulty, a week with people who've had their houses destroyed. And we think of those who are suffering this weekend from those difficulties and into the next week, and we especially remember the families of those who died in these floods. We, we need you now more than ever. We ask that you direct our hearts and our minds towards you and fill us with your spirit, bringing refreshing, renewal, peace and joy. You remind us in your word that you are faithful to carry our burdens. You tell us that you will renew our strength and you promise to give us rest as we come to you. Forgive us for the times we've worked so hard to be self-sufficient, forgetting our need for you living apart from your spirit. Forgive us for letting fear and worry control our mind and for allowing pride and selfishness to wreak havoc over our lives. Forgive us for not following your ways and for living apart from your presence. Thank you that your ways are far greater than our ways and your thoughts far deeper than our thoughts. Thank you that you had a plan to redeem us. Thank you that you make all things new. We thank you that your face is towards the righteous, that you are close to the broken heart, that you hear our prayer and that you know our heart. Thank you for your daily powerful presence in our lives, that we can be sure, no matter what we face, that your heart is towards us. Your eyes are over us and your ears are open to our prayer. Thank you that you surround us with favour as with a shield and we are safe in your care. We give you praise and honour for your ways are righteous and true. We give you worship for you are holy and just. We know that your land's love stands firm forever for your loving kindness and your forever. Amen. Uh, this song we're going to sing now um, was quoted in the letter that, or the email that came out to you during the week uh, or at the end of the week to talk about um, whether we'd be meeting or not and I thought it was very appropriate for us to, to use that today. might be one that you want to use as a prayer. It is an oldie but um, Brian Dirksen who, who wrote Faithful One has put out a, a, a new version of it so if you really like to have a look at that on YouTube, um, it's great to see him singing this one that was uh, published first in 89 uh, through Vineyard. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed watching him uh, sing again uh, this beautiful song. The words are a great encourage. You are my rock in times of trouble. So let's stand and sing this as a prayer. <coughs> Painful one, so unchanging, ageless one, you're my rock of peace, Lord of all, I depend on you. 
Let's just give thanks for the offer tree. Lord God, we thank you for um, these gifts that uh, people have given today. And we thank you for the gifts, Lord, that you give us all the time. We pray, Father God, for uh, wisdom in using this money, that it will be used wisely and for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom here in the hills and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been today. It's from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 26. Life by the Spirit. So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, adultery and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This is a word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. It's, it's really good to be here. Uh, it always amazes me how I underestimate the emotional impact of being with one another in the room. Uh, maybe I'm just a big fat softy, but uh, I've missed you. Even though I fight with you at times, and I know I do, and even though I've got some whopping big blind spots which you are dying to point out to me, I actually think it's great that we're together in this room. And, and I really, you know, I'm blessed by it. So. so with that in mind, I don't know if we're allowed to, but can we bump elbows and pass the peace while I work out what I'm doing? The peace of the Lord be with you and also with you. we got to make a start. Well, as been said a few times, I do hope you're travelling well, um, despite the various stresses and strains that have come upon us at times. I know folks, there are some folks who are specifically dealing with a lot of illness in their family. Uh, of course, there's the COVID lockdown and approaching winter uh, in the grey skies, 
uh, and the pressures on our health. I, I suppose this has depressed you even more. But um, and the weather's been really solid this week. You know, trees down all over the place. The the hum of chainsaws in the background. There was one going at about six o'clock, six thirty in the dark last night at our place. Thought, now there's commitment. Uh, Jen and I put the trailer on Thursday morning and went out looking for wood in desperation uh, in an attempt to keep the home fires burning. And it's my genuine uh, desire this morning that this, the message this morning will be enlivened by the Spirit of God in a sense to keep the home, uh, home fires burning inside your heart. If it is, if this happens, it won't be me, it'll be the Spirit of God. Last week, Ken talked to us about the Holy Spirit's ministry in the church. He highlighted some amazing truths, uh, such as the Holy Spirit comes to glorify Jesus. Amen. Uh, he brings the presence of God to the church. Uh, the Holy Spirit brings unity and fellowship with one another. I think that's what we experience. Uh, he enlivens the word of God to us. He equips the church with spiritual gifts. He empowers us to live godly lives. Uh, it was a fantastic message. Thank you, Ken. Uh, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, or if you'd like to listen to it again, I really encourage you. Um, I've been encouraging Ken to consider making a sermon series out of it uh, because it's it was such a uh, pack of so much stuff. This week I've been asked to speak about the Holy Spirit's ministry in our personal lives. Uh, which, of course, makes me groan inside. Uh, but before we start, I'd like to pray. Um, yeah, because we're going to need it. Let's just pray. Uh, Father, um, we just ask now that in this moment you would help us, you would still our hearts. Holy Spirit, we pray, we, all, we know that you're here with us this day, we're, this morning, this moment. Deep down in our hearts, we can sense it. We would ask, Holy Spirit, now that you would empower us, that you would enliven your word to us. You would warm the cockles of our hearts. That we may see Jesus more clearly. That we may love him more dearly. And that we would follow him more nearly. In Jesus' name we pray. I went to bed last night, most, just had enough of this message. I've been working on it for a few weeks and it just wasn't clicking. And, uh, um, and I just, and I, you know, at, at these moments you have these crises of confidence and you think, you know, I started off in the wrong direction and I've been building on that ever since and I've wasted my time. I can see Simon nodding in the background, amen, brother. Uh, and, oh, no, I'm going to get up and, you know, it's going to be heresy, you know, I'll have I'll emails, I'll, I'll be excommunicated. I don't know if you can be, can you be excommunicated from the Anglican Church? You can be. Well, there you go. There's something else for me to stress about. Uh, and so when I went to bed, I said, Lord, there's a key missing. There's something wrong. I can't get it. And I just thought, well, I'm going to sleep. In the morning, I woke up, and I think it fell into place. Have you ever experienced this, Naomi? And it's in the bag down there. Now, I've shared this before, but I thought, oh, I've shared this before. But no, um, this is meant to be by running by the Holy Spirit, so here it is. This is the key. You're going to have to use your imagination, folks. Um, the plane. As you know, I was a woodwork teacher for many years. That doesn't mean I'm a craftsman, and there'll be people in this room that will be quick to point that out. Because it's true, I'm not. However, I had the opportunity to teach young people for 20 years how to build things. And one of my favourites, and some people in this room I actually taught, uh, one of the things we used to build was a pencil box. I love pencil boxes, and kids seem to love them. But before you could build a pencil box, I used to have to teach them how to use a plane. Now, there's no use even considering using a plane until you can disassemble it, reset it. Is this not right, Joe? I, I won't get you to check my plane. And you must set the, the plane properly, otherwise it won't work. That means you have to have the right amount of blade showing, etc., etc. So 
the year eights would be given a plane at the beginning of the week and I would take it to them and we would slowly go through this and I would explain to them that this little wheel moves the plane in and out underneath and you adjust it like so if you if you if you wheel that out the plane go the blade goes out if you wheel it in the plane goes in so we would go through that and they would all be listening carefully and then at the end of the show i would say bring me a plane this one i need a screwdriver on bring me a plane and we will start working with it so they bring the plane up and before their very eyes i pull it apart give them the pieces and say, off you go, put it back together again. Well, I don't know, a month would go by. They would come back and I'd say, no, that's no good, let's go through it again, and we'd go through it. And finally, when we got this right, we would, I'd give them a scrap piece of wood, they're nowhere near the pencil box material at the moment, and they would have to plane down five mil to get it straight. The kids had various reactions. Some of them, hated the planes with a passion and what they would do is they wouldn't concentrate and when they got the chance the planes all sat on a wall and while you weren't looking if their plane wasn't going they would go over and grab another one and try and use that and so it didn't take long before every 20 all the 20 planes in the room were not set from some of the kids would listen carefully but at the end of the day just wasn't, weren't interested, and they would constantly be asking, Mr. Park, would you please set the plane for me? And there would be other folk who would, you know, labour away, but when you'd come to instruct, they would say, no, no, I know how to do it, I know how to do it. I have seen kids try to plane without the blade, but this back section, and I've let them do it. So there's only one way you're going to work out, this is. And then, so, and then sometimes you'd find a, a student who was really wanting to do it, and, and you just, and you'd actually have to ask permission, and you'd have to say, and this is the part I believe, this is the part for us. Can I put my hand on top of yours? I would always ask permission. And, and then I would put my hand over theirs, and I would put their hand over here, and I would say, now let's do it together. And we would work because you see you can talk about things to the cows come home but until you teach these parts of your body the feel of the plane and the movement of the plane you'll never get it and i used to say to them you plane with your ears you listen as the plane goes over the timber and if you hear that shh 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 and if you see the, the timber curl up, you've got it right. And of course, I used to exaggerate the hip movement. <laughs> and they'd look and say, well, this is a bit ridiculous. It was the same with the tenon saw. The tenon saw, and I won't carry on about this too much, but the tenon saw, if you twist it to the left or if you twist it to the right, you'll jam it. And when the kids are first starting to learn, and if you want to get a taste of this, try and use a saw with your right, with your off hand. I'm left-handed. You try and use a saw with your your other hand, and you'll get the idea. And there was sometimes there was no other way to get around it, but to have to come up to the child and say, "Listen, can I put my hand on yours?" And you'd put your hand on the child's, and you'd say, "Now feel my wrist. Let's do it together." See, you don't twist your wrist. You keep it straight. No, no, too much pressure, too much pressure. Just like, let the sword do the work. Let the sword do the work. And then you'd step back, and the child would then continue. Can you see why you still love doing it? I may say an awful lot today, but can I suggest to you, that is the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That, I believe, is the essence of the message today. The Holy Spirit wants to get alongside you. He wants to put his hand on yours. He wants to say, no, 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 don't do it this way. Let me, let me go on. But if you noticed Lorraine's 
prayer today, which I believe was the Holy Spirit inspiring her. She said, correct me if I'm wrong, Lorraine, but she said, forgive us for our self-sufficiency, Lord, when we try and do things by ourselves and don't rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. Now that, that was prayed for us right here by Lorraine. That's the Spirit of God moving amongst us, she said. In John chapter 14, verses 25 to 27, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. There are many things we could say about the Holy Spirit and his role in our personal lives. But this morning I have felt compelled to zero in on this particular aspect of the role of the Holy Spirit as our teacher, our guide, and our counsellor, both corporately and personally. I'm going to go at it from a funny angle. But you see, the, the things that we saw, I used to see in the classroom with the kids, that, that sense of uh, resistance to being taught I'll do it my way, I won't do it your way. Or the active, willing learner, the one who will participate with you, or the other student who will not want to do it and just wants you to do it for them. I suspect that that is a default position of the human dilemma in the fallen world, and I would say there's a seed of that in our lives to this day. All of us carry this around as a legacy of being a fallen human being. A little while ago, John Rudenberg uh, lent me a book by Adrian Plass uh, to read entitled The Shadow Doctor. Um, I found it quite confronting and yet uplifting at times. Um, I don't think I would let too much out of the bag if I say that this is about a chap who seeks to help others face some issues in their lives which disables them from experiencing the fullness that God offers them. This chap is called the Shadow Doctor, and his quote paraphrase, and this quote paraphrase comes from a discussion this fellow has with another guy called Jack. So this is from the novel. The Shadow Doctor smiled appreciatively. <clears throat> I like you, Jack. You come back and you drink my whiskey. You can come back and drink my whiskey any time. You're completely right, of course. There can be a very thin line between cheerful obedience and some bone-aching struggle to pretend that we're better than we are. And that dividing line is getting thinner by the moment, thought Jack. He stared into the fire, his whole body tensing with the effort it would take to release the words that were already shaping his lips. As I said to you on the phone the other day, Doc, I've always struggled, always. Doc nodded his head slowly but said nothing. Jack wasn't sure if he was experiencing the effects of the Holy Spirit, but what he knew for sure was that he felt an unprecedented sense of freedom and safety. I've tried so hard, he said. I really have. But I'm beginning to feel like someone who's ended up in the sea after a plane crash, lonely, I'm not sure how much longer I can stay afloat. I'm not too sure about you, but I can relate with this at times. With that sense of struggle and failure described by Jack, you try so hard to do the right thing. You try so hard to be patient, to be kind, or to be good, or to be faithful. But instead, the opposite seems to have its way. I don't know what else can vouch for this. So if you happen to be feeling a bit overwhelmed like Jack this morning, and I wouldn't blame you considering the, the storms and all the rest of the stuff, if you feel that you've been buffeted by the winds and the waves as you float, float around in the sea of circumstances you find yourself in, a reading like this morning's may not be exactly what you want to hear. You see, it may simply add to the duties and the obligations that you are already straining for. Because the list of the fruit of the Spirit, patience, kindness, you know, I don't even know all the rest of it. 
it comes across as a list of do's and don'ts which if you don't follow closely and if you don't read that scripture properly, you'll walk away with this idea that you can be disinherited from the kingdom of God if you don't keep the list going. And that can make you cringe inside and reinforce that ever-present sense of failure that some of us carry around with us all the time. There is a sense of failing to perform and maintain God's standard. The cheeky part of me was going to produce a survey. This is wicked. And on that survey, it was going to have patience, peace, kindness. And on the right-hand side, it was going to have a scale. And I was going to put it out to everyone and say, now rate yourselves. <laughs> oh, it's a terrible thing to do. Because I guess all of us, we've been putting ourselves up at the zero point. Am I the only one that sort of struggles with this sense of, I'm just not performing well enough? And so you put a list up like that, and then there's the negative side, which I'm sure we could all tick a few boxes. The bottom line is that, well, let me, let me give you another example. John and Paula Sanford in their book entitled Transformation of the Inner Man. Now, I know John and Paula Sanford aren't necessarily everyone's flavour, but they wrote this book called Transformation of the Inner Man. And they make the following comment about uh, a mindset where they're referring to a number of Christians that they have met and counselled over the years. They say, and I quote, The mind hears the message of the free gift of salvation through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And the spirit sighs in relief, but the heart has long been trained to strive to please for the wrong reasons. After the glow of conversion dies down, performance resurrects with a vengeance. And now that same Christian has a father in heaven with demanding standards to live up to. And so in an attempt to gain his approval, the person becomes performance oriented. You add this, add to this Christ's example, which is heaped upon them, and it only matter, makes matters worse for such people. Life quickly becomes possible. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I suggest that this performance orientation and quest for approval is for the wrong reasons, and it's very much part of the fallen fa fabric of fallen mankind. Consequently, many things in our Christian lives, which were never intended to be burdens to be bare, become so, and are the very things, and the very things that are meant to set us free are the very things that imprison us. So, taken the wrong way, a scripture like that today can actually imprison. Now, when I was thinking about this, I could hear the voice, of the words of Jesus straight away ringing in my mind. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy burden, and I will give you peace. I will give you rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you experience that? Can you hear it? Do you want it? I know I do. Let me, let, let me, in, let me, I'll, there's a secret, in a sense, that we overlook all the time. But this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to us personally. To continue the work of Jesus, and so to speak, to empower and set the captives free, so that we may experience the fullness of life offered by the Lord. So what do we do with such readings as we read this morning? Well, as you know, as I know, a well-known preacher is fond of saying the first three rules of biblical interpretation are context, context. Let's read together some of Paul's earlier statements about the Christian war in the very same chapter of Galatians. I'm going to read to you from the paraphrase, the message. Christ has set us free to live a free life, 
So take a stand. Never again let anybody put a harness of slavery on. I'm emphatic about this. The moment any of you submits to circumcision or any other rule-keeping system, at that same moment Christ's hard-won gift of freedom is squandered. I repeat my warning. The person who accepts the ways of circumcision trades all the advantages of a free life in Christ for the obligations of the slave life of the law. It was Paul's position that the way of grace and the way of law are mutually exclusive. The whole basic fault of the man who took away, took the way of obedience, because you see the issue was the Galatians were wanting to embrace circumcision again. They had become Christians, they had experienced the freedom of the Spirit, and then there was this teaching that we will embrace the circumcision to make us more acceptable to God. And Paul was having a pink fit about this because he could see that this was the beginning of the end for them because they would be moving from the freedom of the Spirit to the slavery of the law. <laughs> he says the whole basic fault of the man who took the way of obedience to the law was that he assumed that he could do something that would win the merit of, in the eyes of God. Circumcision would somehow make them more worthy. The way of the law makes salvation dependent on human achievement. On the other hand, the person who takes the way of grace simply casts themselves and their sin upon the mercy and love of God. The Galatians had known this truth at the beginning, but now they were turning back to the law by thinking circumcision would make them more acceptable to God. They, they sought to add something to the grace offered to them. They had returned to being performance orientated, not unlike the fictional character, Jack, in the book The Shadow Doctor, or the folk in Sanford's book, Transformation of the Inner Man. I'm suggesting to you it's a common default position that we all seem to battle with at different times to varying levels. The quest to pull ourselves up by the bootlaces and make ourselves more acceptable to God. To embrace a performance orientation and without realising it, trying to add something to God's mercy and grace. In a nutshell, of all the things that could be said about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives, it is this area that I feel compelled to bring to your attention this morning. To stress that the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to set us free from this default position of performance orientation. Let's pick up where Paul left off in Galatians chapter 5. He then moves on. It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. And that's how the freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. For in no time at all you will be annihilating each other. And where would your precious freedom be then? My counsel is this. Live freely, animated, and motivated by God's Spirit. Then you won't feed the convulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with the free spirit, just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. 
These two ways of life are opposed to one another, so that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? Let me repeat that last sentence. Why don't you choose to be led by the Holy Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of law-dominated existence? We sometimes somehow go back to this default position of embracing things in our Christian war and making them into some sort of performance orientation. Whereas the starting point, so you could start with Galatians 5 again, you could read the list and you could say, well, gee, I'm going to have to try a lot harder because I'm not doing very well. And that will make me more acceptable to God. Or we could go back and say, now, what's the precursor? The precursor is choose to live by the Spirit of God. And he will give you the strength and the desires to do that. And it won't become such an issue. It's a bit like the student, and that's why I think that this business is actually quite significant. When I ask, can I put my hands on your hands and show you how to do it, you could react and say, no, I can do it myself. There's a willfulness there. You remember that song by, uh, oh, what's his name? I did it my way. Frank Sinatra. There's a willfulness there. I can do it myself. I can maintain control. Because if I give you control, my goodness, you might want me to do something I don't want to do. So I'll do it myself. I don't like the particular path that we're going. I don't want to work on a silly piece of timber. I want to do the pencil box. That willfulness is with us. When all along the Holy Spirit is saying, please, could you just let it slip? Just nestle into me. Let me put my hand on yours. And let me show you how to do it. And the rest will look after itself. That's the starting point when it comes to living by the Spirit of God and the freedom of others. I have to say that Ken came up to me just before we started and he said, you know, I have felt this week there's been a real challenge to us as a church to not live in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a real powerlessness there. And as he was saying that to me, I thought to myself, and that's what happens when we try and control things, when we try and become the author of our own learning and our own destiny. Straight away we fall into this powerlessness because we've shifted away. We've said to the Holy Spirit, now go away. I can do this myself, thank you. And straight away we fall upon our own, re our own resources and we fall up. So... I'm encouraging us today to not simply pay the Holy Spirit lip service, but to actually invite him to lead, guide, and strengthen us in our lives and to believe that as a counsellor, he's keen to do it. To actually realise, you know what? He's actually here. I'm talking about a mindset which chooses to orientate the posture of our heart toward and in tandem with the Holy Spirit. To not just give him lip service, but to actually change the direction and choose. We do this, and so can practical things. I mean, a couple of practical things, and you know what I'm going to say. To do this, let's make time every day to expose ourselves to God's word, asking the Holy Spirit to enliven God's word to us. And as things are pointed out to us, to invite the Holy Spirit to enable us to apply such promptings to our lives. There you go. I know a lot of people in this room do that, but I want to encourage you to persist in it. To actually treat the Holy Spirit as someone who's actually there, not some theoretical... So I'm going to read the Bible today, five minutes, or ten minutes. Lord, could you please tell me what is it about this? And be sensitive to the little promptings. Lord, you're going to really have to give me a lot of strength about that because I don't want to do it. Open up dialogue. 
See, the emphasis is not on us doing the enlightening and enabling, but on the Holy Spirit to do so. We orientate the posture of our hearts towards the Holy Spirit by asking him to guide us and to inspire us. And when praying and talking to the Father in heaven. We orientate the posture of our hearts when speaking to others. When we shoot up an arrow prayer and say, Lord, could you please, what is, this, is there something I can say to this person? Why don't we take seriously this week, and I know a number of you do, so I'm not being, I don't want to be offensive, but let's take another look at this and take seriously the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives and choose to orientate the posture of our hearts towards Him. As we do this, as we shift our focus from what we can do for God, from, from what we can do for God in our own strength, that is performance orientation, and onto the freedom and strength that God offers us through his Holy Spirit. Hmm. I hope that makes sense. Let's pray. Father, Holy Spirit, we want to take you more seriously in our lives. We don't want to just pay you lip service and we don't want to just be willful and keep grabbing the plane back, so to speak. May we be more compliant and active learners. May we um, invite you into more and more aspects of our lives. May we grow to be more like Jesus. and to be good students, in Jesus' name. Would you like to stand? And uh, I thought I might just pray as we go into this song. Uh, Holy Spirit, as we sing these words of truth, would you enliven these words? Would you uh, help us to take seriously what you have to say to us? And as we go out, may we take what you say to us and carry it in. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. See
Gosh, thanks, music team. I've really loved the songs this morning. It's just been beautiful. I don't know about you, but I feel really uplifted by being here this morning uh, in this dreary week. It's been wonderful. Uh, and thanks, Bruce, for the message. It was a wonderful reminder about the free gift of salvation and the fullness of life offered by the Lord. Thankfully, we don't have to be graded for our performance. And thanks, Bruce, for not doing that. <laughs> it's been great spending time with you today, and we hope you have enjoyed the service. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that life is actually very difficult for some people at the moment. And I particularly think of people who've been badly affected again by the lockdown, whose income has dropped, whose businesses have suffered, those who suffer from illness, uh, mental health issues, and those who are lonely. We will also continue to pray for those who've had property damage and are still experiencing difficulty still the, since the storms. Uh, we've decided to open the food store for just half a day tomorrow. We normally don't open on a public holiday, but we thought, well, at the moment, uh, we can't go anywhere or do anything, and there's lots of people in need, so we're going to be operating in the morning just um, in a reduced capacity, but we can still help people who need it. So if you know anybody who could use a hand with food, please um, come along between 9 and 12. Uh, I would urge you if you are suffering or just lonely or wish to talk about the service today, uh, maybe you didn't understand something or would like to uh, learn how to move along in your faith, to please contact someone to have a chat. Do it today, now, if you're here uh, when we finish the service. Um, I'm sure Bruce will Ken would love to have a chat with you about it. And uh, one of our church leaders would be certainly happy if you wanted to contact them during the week to have a chat. Or you can contact us via the church website. Uh, let us pray as we go. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our paths, and strength to our lives. Take and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, morning tea is on. Let's share a cuppa together. <laughs> 